I appreciate him in talking to the unquire. I'm in the home of syncope units, and uh, we're the outliers. But here we go. So what we're going to cover, what, what is the risk? So why do we even need syncope units? What do we do when we first see the patients? What do the guidelines say, regardless of what we do? We'll talk a bit about scores, and then does syncope really matter at all? except unless you faint. So what's the risk of an adverse outcome? This is a meta-analysis by Monica Solbiati from Milan, a very talented young investigator. And she uh, did what she could with the mess of data that looked at outcomes over the two or three years after patients were seen in the emergency department, right? So not in your clinic, not in hospital, in the emergency department. And when she put the data all together, of course, they're very heterogeneous. But what she found was that the mortality at one year is 8%, which is actually pretty substantial if you think about it. It's, uh, if, if this was a sudden death mortality, everybody would be getting an ICD. Uh, and you can certainly pick out subgroups that are worse. What are they like in the first 10 days? So 10 days is a, is a very fast horizon. 10 days essentially says what is going to happen during their admission not how quickly can I get them seen, but what is gonna, what's going to happen in the next week and a half. And even here, uh, adverse events and mortality are 9%. Now, these are adverse events by emergency department standards, and a lot of them are not what we would call adverse events. They're a new diagnosis, something like that. Or They actually classify putting in a pacemaker as an adverse event. So anybody here implant? Right. <laughs> Nonetheless, we need to do something about these people. Uh, they can, the, the, the emerged guys are doing a reasonable job. They know how to, what they do know how to do is they know how to pick out the healthy ones. They know how to send home, let me rephrase that. The ones that they send home do pretty well. The ones that they admit are all over the place. Uh, this is by Giorgio Costantino, who's actually trained Monica Solbiati. Uh, and in this paper from a long time ago now, they looked at the kinds of deaths, and I think it's worth remembering that little table down on the right. So 40% of deaths, they never knew what, what was the cause of them. Sudden death, right, so this is an EP session. Sudden death was less than 10% of the causes of death. <coughs> and everybody's worried about syncope in the emergency department, but sudden death is low. And then there were other things. Lung disease, for example, cancer, stroke, it's all kinds of things. And you have to ask yourself, what does syncope have to do with most of these? Nonetheless, here we are in the emergency department with a syncope patient. Uh, for those of you who are struggling with ESC versus ACC, they all sort of mean the same. You just have to get past the particular definitions that they use. If it's class one for both of them, that essentially says you must do it unless you really, really, really don't want to. Class two is split into class 2A, which says you should do it. Class 2B says you could do it if you really want to. And then class three says don't do it unless you really have to. And, and so don't worry about the fine print and how they decided what must, should, could, don't, how they got there. That's basically what they say. So what do we know about guidelines and syncope units? The, we published one nearly 10 years ago in Canada, and it's widely quoted as saying, don't do it, don't have syncope units, don't do risk scores. But all we said was, we don't really know. There's not enough evidence yet to declare that they work, which means you could do it. The uh, ACCAHA um, stressed... Uh, it, it took a slightly different tack. What they said was, at the start, everybody has a good history of physical and ECG. The evidence for ECG is not all that great, but they're cheap. Uh, and it says right at the start, you need to work out what the risk is. What it accepted was that uh, for a lot of patients, no matter how hard we struggle, no matter how close our history and physical is, are, uh, that, that you just keep, you don't get an answer the first time. It says, therefore, you, you really need to sort out if they're uh, low risk or not low risk. Uh, and so risk assessment is, is right in this, 
in the middle of this. The further evaluation part is the tricky part, and that's mainly what we'll be talking about. Uh, what they said was, you know, if they're high risk, and I'll show you what the risk factors are. If they're high risk, then you should be admitting them. If they're low risk, you should not be admitting them. And if they're intermediate risk, that's really the core of what we're talking about today is what do you do with the ones where you're not sure about anything? <coughs> the ESC, very fine print, all I'm going to say is uh, it's class one for, you know, the non-A, non-B patients. Uh, should have some kind of structured observation somewhere, either in the emergency department or a syncope unit, either as an inpatient or as an outpatient. It's a broad category. Uh, and they said the risk stratification scores are not great. They are could. But I think they're mainly useful as an aid memoir. So must. There's not much that you must do. You must do a history and a physical. Uh, that's appropriate, and you must do a 12 lead ECG. The reason you do 12 lead ECG is although the, the pickup is very low, they're cheap, and so it's easy to make them cost effective. What about risk scores? So there are a lot of risk scores. Uh, there's at least one from the UK, one or two from uh, the US, a bunch from Italy, and uh, what they say here is could, and could means actually there's not a lot of evidence that they're really all that great, despite the enormous amount of work that's gone into them. So let's just take a look. These are the risks. This is, these are solid, solid lines now. This is, these are uh, from meta-analyses and Bayesian analysis of essentially the same data set. So these things are real. Older patients are at high risk of something. If they've had a recent one or two spells, right? So not the vasovagal ones who've been fainting all their lives. If they have palpitations ahead of time, supine and with sweaty exertion, right? So that's what, and this is mainly to pick up the genetic arrhythmias. Structural heart disease and heart failure, we all know that. Family history of early sudden death, we know that. Hypotension, well, that's sort of a no-brainer, but it did make it into it. Evidence of hemorrhage. So this is mainly for GI bleeds in eMERGE and uh, uh, not for more cr chronic problems. You'll ask what an abnormal ECG is, and the problem is this work was done by eMERGE docs. And an ECG is either normal from a computer or abnormal from a computer. And so everything gets lumped in here. Right. So how good are they? Well, the granddaddy of the scores uh, is the San Francisco syncope uh, rule. Um, and uh, it's been evaluated many times. There were, this is a review of all of them from about eight years ago. Uh, and they looked at 12 studies that had over 5,300 patients. And what they did was quite an interesting approach. They looked at the best sensitivity and specificity for each of them. And the, those are the sort of medium-sized blue dots. And the size of the dot is, the, is it reflects the size of the study population. And uh, in that cloud in the middle is um, a repetitive modeling of, of what the mean of all these things really is. And the little blue dot is the point estimate. And then the red curve I did in PowerPoint just to show you what an ROC curve might look like. And you can see it's actually, it's not bad. You know, it's much better than Timmy. It's much better than Chad's. It's really not bad. The trouble is that the reason why they're doing this is to keep people out of eMERGE accurately. And these scores still admit an awful lot of people. The, uh, um, the, the mean sensitivity, the likelihood that they'll pick up what needs to be picked up is 87%, so it's actually pretty good. The problem is the specificity, right? The specificity is only 50%, which means that they're going to admit 50% of patients. And so the scores uh, are, are good for picking up bad stuff, but they're not very good for reducing admissions. Uh, this was a more recent uh, score from the very large Basel um, 9 consortium. It's a multi-center, multinational, prospective, densely granular um, uh, registration and follow-up of emergency patients for up to three years. I think it's, it's they're putting a ton of work into it with a lot of data, 
and uh, they looked at 1,500 patients, followed them for two years, and they had enough data to actually go back and enro- and, and look at these patients in, with nine different scores that are out there. So the question is, how good is it? Well, this is the good news. So this is just a representative one. This is the OSIL score, um, which, as you recall, looked spectacular and was very simple. And indeed, it works. Uh, the green line, the lowest risk group in OSIL is a zero, and the, and the, the um, <coughs> yellow one shows that they do extremely well over the first two years. And the worst one, you know, the OSIL three and four, uh, they have a, a mortality that's about what, what uh, the uh, first study uh, reported. So the score looks like it does very well. But look and see where the red line sort of bottoms out. Right, The red line doesn't bottom out at 0% survival. The red line bottoms out at 80% survival. And what that means is you're still going to be admitting a lot of people that don't need to be admitted. When they rolled up all the scores, they did um, receiver-operator characteristic analysis of all the scores, and then they took the area under the curve, the C statistic. And remember, 1.0 is perfect, 0.5 is random. So the further you are from 0.5 to 1, the better. And then they did it for all the scores, including Chad's and Chad's Vask. And it turns out Chad's and Chad's Vask, actually, they're about as good as anything else. You may as, and, th- and then you get to screen them for uh, having to anticoagulate them when they fall and have a subdural. Um, and so they looked at their ability to predict death. Pretty good uh, for major adverse uh, e- events. Uh, pretty good, even predicting cardiac syncope. They look pretty good, except the area under the curve for these is all around 0.65 to 0.7. Again, that's just like, you know, the sloppy Chad's and uh, Timmy scores that we use. So these scores probably won't keep people out of eMERGE, um, and it, it, especially if you're, they're sensitive enough to pick up the ones that you really want to admit. So they're all better than doing nothing, they're actually about as good as Chad's is for anticoagulating atrial fibrillation. And if you look at the data, it's not all that good, really. Um, but none improve accuracy above clinical judgment, and there have been three papers on that. Oh, here they are. So there have been three uh, that I could find uh, in the last uh, 15 years. They use different methodology for each of them, but none of the scores are better than what eMERGE docs are doing. So actually, the eMERGE docs are doing a pretty good job, or at least... They can't be beaten by the scores. And that's why the scores are not rated all that high, because although they're a great idea and they give you some things to remember when you're down in eMERGE, high-risk features to remember, they really don't behave any better than a physician in eMERGE, and most of these are eMERGE physicians. There's one recent one that shows some promise, but it ha- and, and it's been validated, and it seems to work well, but in the international environment we don't know yet, and it's out of the University of Ottawa. And it was by far the, the, the largest effort. It was a huge, prospective, data-dense, multi-center, multi-city, multi-province uh, uh, initiative. And it was developed, and it was replicated, and it's now being implemented uh, uh, in a lot of centers across the country. And these are the points that fell out of it. It's the usual logistic regression methodology. These are the points that fell out of it. And what you need to look at carefully here is how the points work. So the points that predict a bad outcome are positive. The points that predict a sorry, a good outcome or po- bad outcome or positive, good outcome or negative. And the negative points both say vasovagal syncope. Either I saw vasovagal syncope or it sure looks like vasovagal syncope. And then all the others sort of look like the other risk scores. Um, troponin, for example. Funny-looking ECG. How well does it work? Well, this is the time to a serious outcome in the emergency department in the first 24 hours for a low risk score, a medium risk score, and a high risk score. And the low risk score, the blue guy at the top, so nothing happens. I should add, when you, if you have the misfortune to go back and look at the papers on how the, the scores were derived, they were actually all derived 
um, and and they were heavily influenced by what happened to patients in eMERGE and then validated there. So it, it's really kind of a cheat because who cares, right? We have to see them after something has not happened. Uh, so it, it actually works pretty well. And what it says is, you know, if you look at where the curve starts to flatten out, you really only have to watch them and should watch them in eMERGE for six hours. So put them on a monitor. By the time it takes to get a registrar down there and then a senior registrar down there and then a cardiologist down there and then an EP guy down there, it's more than six hours. The question is, what do you do afterwards? And this is the risk of serious outcomes afterwards. And you can see how... Uh, many patients are in it by how fine the steps are. Uh, so the answer is you have to wait about, you know, most things that pop up, pop up within two weeks. And, and in particular, most arrhythmic outcomes happen within two weeks. So six hours in eMERGE, two weeks after. Uh, and so those, essentially the Ottawa rules is that you should be watching them for six hours in eMERGE, but at least in Canadian eMERGEs, they're lucky if they get in a bed within the first six hours. Uh, and then to have some kind of external ECG monitoring. And it's, you know, there's a lot of competition now in the market for this, but only two weeks. And then after that, you can see in your clinic and it's much more leisurely, you can work it out because the risk of something happening is really pretty low. You can predict what happens to patients, actually, by uh, at, quantitatively, essentially with the Charlson uh, co comorbidity score. The risk of serious events, most of it has nothing to do with arrhythmias. Remember, arrhythmias are only 7 or 8% of outcomes. Most of it is it's just a lot of other internal medicine stuff. Hypertension, myocardial infarction, sure. Dementia, COPD, rheumatoid disease, these all predict adverse outcomes from syncope patients. Cancer, metastatic tumors. If you look at the causes of death, this is uh, some stuff we did in, in uh, Alberta from administrative databases. Causes of death, uh, you know, a bit more than half are cardiovascular, but they're not arrhythmic. And it's probably, this is an old sick population and everybody has heart disease. The question then is, do we really need syncope units to sort this out? Now the era uh, uh, has produced a document uh, that's very dense in stuff, a lot of recommendations with targets as to what good outcomes are. And the target is less than 20% admitted and less than 5% readmission rate. And, and in Canada, because, because A, we have no beds, we're number 30 out of 34 in the OECD for beds per capita. Uh, and because our eMERGE docs, I think, are trained for five years, they're actually pretty good. We slag them all the time, but they're pretty good. So only 15% are admitted now, and the number is dropping. Probably within five years, we'll be below 10%. There is a finite level you must not go below because these are old sick people. Um, the mortality looks like everybody else's and we have a 1% admission rate. I think that's what's driving it. It's just, it's good training and practical. We can't get people into hospital and so we don't. So if I had to guess where things would be going in the next five or 10 years, it actually would not look like the way it's going in Europe which for what now includes the UK. And that is the low-risk ones are sent home. And the low-risk ones, if you look at the Ottawa score, the low-risk ones are the ones where an eMERGE doc says that's vasovagal or initial static hypertension, period. The other ones, they sort of stumble over a bit. The not low-risk, remember hepatitis A, B, and non-A, non-B? So the not low-risk ones, monitor them for six hours. You don't need to monitor a vasovagal patient for six hours. Monitor them for six hours. If you get an answer, do something. If you don't get an answer, send them home and monitor them for two weeks. Uh, and if you still don't get an answer, then you have to decide, are they really complex? Is this an internal medicine issue, not a cardiology issue? Or is, is this a pretty straightforward, and there's some kind of arrhythmia going on, I don't know what. So then the question is, tilt versus ILR. And we're doing a study now to try to sort out whether you should tilt or put in an expensive, useless ILR. Thank you.
I think what makes Dr. Sheldon the consummate trialist is the equipoise with which he goes into his trials about the tilt versus ILR. Um, no, no, have, son. A few minutes for, <laughs> for questions, if there are any. Everybody here works in syncope units. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a lot of bias. I guess one of the things that always intrigues me about the scores, with the possible exception of the last one that you mentioned, is they focus on outcomes at one year or two years. Um, I've, never, I've never met an eMERGE doc that actually cares beyond 24 hours. No. I was wondering if you could speak to that. No, uh, you're exactly right. So the scores... Um, to get him out. Uh, a, a lot of the work is done by cardiologists or... Sorry, a lot of the analysis is done by internists and cardiologists. Emerge docs, of course, have a very short timeline. In Canada, their timeline is, when can I have an, another empty bed? And so, um, you know, one or two years, that's fine. They, they identify the people that should be seen in some kind, by someone who knows something about complex diseases. The short-term ones, really, you know, the question really is, is something really terrible going to happen such that I can intervene in hospital? Or is there a problem that I can only do like a cath by admitting them to hospital? And it's a whole different set of rules. And they're much harder studies to do because the outcome rate is so low in the first month. I think my, my bias is probably... Uh, an event horizon of two weeks would be about right, but maybe a month, something like that, but not a year or two years for deciding whether or not to admit them. Dr. Whitehouse. What, what monitoring do you suggest for that two weeks? So uh, what, what well, you can go you? upstairs. Sorry, the question is, what kind of monitor you, do you, you be use for two weeks? And uh, so the, Canada's way behind the times in a lot of things now. When I come to Europe and the UK, we are way behind. We still use the King of Hearts a lot, which, of course, patients hate. Um, there are devices coming out now. They're either just in the market or will be in the market in the next couple or three years. Uh, Venk uh, Thuraganis and Banda Murthy is working with a company based in Quebec City, I think, that has one that's a very nifty band-aid kind of device that lasts two weeks, but I, you know, I don't have a bias. My sense is if patients have symptoms that last a long time, if they're having tons of presyncope as well as their syncope, then just getting one of the cardia devices uh, would be fine. I think they're great because if you have enough time, they can record what, what's going on. Do you need to interrogate daily? Oh, uh, yeah, so that, God, I hope not. Uh, that, that all, the, you know, <laughs> the need to see them daily is really based upon your fear, either evidence-based or industry-based that you need to see what's happening right away because they might die. Uh, whereas uh, assessing physicians, most of us are calmer about arrhythmias than eMERGE docs are, and, and, and we're quite happy collecting it at the end. The risk of sudden death, so Venk's, Venk's study was huge, and the risk of sudden death is trivially small. It just almost doesn't exist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Bob, can I just ask one oh, I have another very, talk. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, one very quick question. But obviously, the, the, um, the data that you present it sounds great and it's fantastic and um, two weeks of monitoring, brilliant. So ha what then happens to patients in Canada? Who then sees them after that to make the decisions about where you go from there? Oh, because this isn't what we do. <laughs> this is what I'm telling you to do. No, no, we have the same disjointed, fragmented, seamful care that you do. Right? It's a, it's a miracle that anybody gets care at all. This is just what we should do. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Dr. Sheldon. The next speaker is... Uh, Dr. Boone Lim from Hammersmith Hospital, London. 
alternative therapy for VVS, vasovagal syncope. Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to speak, Richard Satish. So, <clears throat> alternative therapies, and I think we'd start off talking about alternative therapies by talking about the mechanisms of syncope, because uh, in, in my experience, uh, a lot of this talk was going to be on the ablation aspect, which is the kind of special alternative therapy that we do. Richard's got a whole talk on that to follow. So I'd like to kind of defocus on the ablation. I will talk a bit about that. But I think the alternative therapy we can all give our patients is to really take ownership of our patients. And to do that, we need to understand uh, the mechanism of syncope because in order to communicate and educate our patients, we need to understand syncope ourselves. So this is a nice paradigm by which we can try and follow the train of complex reflexes that occur in, in syncope. And it's quite, in my opinion, reasonably easy to follow if there is a laser pointer. This is point? No. No, there's a pointer under another. Oh, no, it doesn't work. So we have a tilt response, which I can't point to you, but it's that guy, Satish. Ta-da! <laughs> and, oh, please, please stay. Uh, and, and as we're... Thank you so much. Thank you, William. And, and as, we, as we stand up, uh, think of it as uh, saying to your patients that blood is being drawn by gravity from your heart and your brain into your lower limbs. So I often stand up whilst I'm sitting with my patients, stand in the middle of the room like this, and let them see what's going on so that they, they get it. And when the blood falls into your lower limbs and empties the heart, you have reduction in ventricular filling, a reduction in stroke volume, and you can imagine doing this motion with your hands in front of your patient, that your heart is now empty, and every stroke that you're giving your carotid baroreceptor, so this kind of receptor in your neck that compresses and that expands and contracts with every contraction, then starts to get weak in the first 10 seconds after you stand. And when that happens, uh, it's, it, it generates a whole series of impulses that go to the brain and start off this complex reaction which is mediated by sympathetic activation and parasympathetic withdrawal. And when we think about it like this, and, we, and when we explain to our patients what is going on, we can then start to pick out some of the very many symptoms that they describe and attribute it to a mechanism that we understand, and most importantly, they also understand. So for example, because of this process that we've demonstrated and that we now all understand, we now have increased sympathetic surge. And that explains to the patient why they feel tachycardia. So why do your patients feel palpitations before they faint? Why do they uh, feel the symptoms of an adrenaline rush? So your patients get a bit breathless, some may get chest pain, some feel dizzy, some feel just very generally unwell, some get uh, the splanchnic uh, symptoms that give them the uh, problems with nausea and dizziness. And then you can also uh, think about what happens to the uh, reflexes with respect to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Maybe you don't explain this to your patient, but you understand that. And you understand that we can detect uh, sympathetic discharges. So these are, are physiological things that happen to an extent to all of us in this room now if we were to stand up in a dehydrated environment postprandially. So that could happen to all of us. And in terms of thinking about the treatment or alternate treatment strategies, I think it's worth thinking about trying to attack every single one of these uh, aspects that occur. And this is some of, uh, th this is the way that I would try and anchor your discussion or your uh, understanding about what alternate treatments there are. So I quite like to start from the beginning. So tilt training, let's say, uh, oh, no, so tilt training comes in a different talk. Let's go external compression. Now, external compression, um, and I struggled for a long time with this because I was prescribing what I call granny stockings. I would just write to the GP and say, can you just prescribe them? Great to 
compression stockings, which ideally as high as possible. And the patients simply were not wearing them. They were either too tight, uh, too loose. They would only last a week and then they go into the wash and then they would disintegrate or fall apart. Now, I've since spoken to a, a couple of vascular surgeons and this is what they would say. Get your patient to get a good pair of compression stockings. So there are two makes that I would say to the patients, try and get your GP to prescribe because these are prescription stockings that you can get for uh, venous ulcerations for lymphedema. And this is one of them. And it costs about 70 quid. Your, most of your patients should be able to, most of them, afford 70 quid to buy a good pair that will withstand, I guess, multiple washes. And this will last three to six months. So Sigvaris is one brand. It's a Swiss brand. I don't own any shares. The other one is Baofine. I also don't own any shares. But these are compression stockings that you can go tell your patients to go online and take a made-to-measure thing, wear it, and ideally get the ones that come and give you a bit of splanchnic compression. So I learn a lot from my patients. There's a patient who came back to me to say the Rego shapewear thing, which is a bit like Spanx, which looks like this, um, has a bit of a lacy uh, kind of motif and is easy to wear even in the summertime. And I'm beginning to appreciate the value of splanchnic constriction. So remember I talked about standing up and thinking of your blood dropping into your lower limbs? Well, use the other analogy that you've just come back after a lunch break and that your blood is dropping in the very large capacity splanchnic system, which is that reservoir of blood that lines your gut, your intestines. And the way to communicate this to the patients is to say, after a meal, I also feel sleepy. Because it's a natural response that your blood is being shunted away from your heart and your brain. And so it's natural for the blood pressure to drop. If you are susceptible to basal vagus syncope, this is when you might be in a warm meeting after a lunch break, and this is where you might feel the onset of the tachycardia, the palpitations, the, the shortness of breath, and then wanting to step out of the meeting room and not quite making it. This is a common scenario that patients present with. And you can explain it by the splanchnic system. So the number of patients who I have tweaked that actually, if that is the symptom profile coming into my clinic, I will almost always get them to get a pair of nice high splanchnic under the breast compression. And it can work a treat. It can also work a treat in your patients who are more elderly because they find the putting on the, this pantyhose very difficult if they've got arthritic fingers, if they're above 65, 70. But the ones that fit just at the thigh level going up to just underneath the breast, can really work wonders. So these are elderly patients with orthostatic intolerance. So tips and tricks, and really to empower you all to just say this to your patient after this lecture. You can already start to put this in practice and give the, the, give the advice. Isometric counterpressure exercises. Um, and this uh, group of exercises are something that we always tell patients to do. And Walter Wheeling has shown that if you have a tilt and you're starting to drop your blood pressure, still being held in a tilt up position, when you do your isometric counterpressure exercises, you can actually boost the blood pressure. So this really works. And your patients will tell you that it can work acutely. And more powerfully, if you were tilting them or allowing them to have a response where they were doing this, and then you re-emphasize how beneficial this can be, you can set up a loop of positive reinforcement. So if they feel it works and they learned that, it, that it's something very tangible they can do every time they feel presyncopal, it can tr be transformative. Not enough is said about this in our day-to-day -day practice. So there are a few subtleties in these pictures and I just want to point out to you because this is the kind of perfect patient from, from <laughs> Wouter's lab. And the posture that you can see here, the first one on the left-hand side, not only shows you uh, the benefit of a leg raise. So a leg raise is a very powerful uh, isometric exercise because immediately you're returning half your blood volume into your leg. So if people are prone to fainting sitting at their desk, you get them to buy one of those IKEA stools, quite high, you know, the ones that get the little boy to go to the toilet. 
they can change and shift their leg positions one at a time. That's a very practical thing. And the other thing this patient is doing, I don't know whether you can see, related to the splachnic system. Can any of you pick out what he's doing? Good, he's pressing the tummy. So if you are holding your hands like this and leaning slightly forwards, you, as some of the, you in the room already are, you are already giving some compression in your splanchnic bed. And I often say to patients, and they say back to me, that when I see them in clinic, they are crossing their legs and they're fidgeting, and they're sitting like Bob Sheldon with the with their hands crossed like this, leaning forwards, they're likely to have a low blood pressure. The fidgeters have learned to cope with their low blood pressure state by adopting a natural posture that helps. So this is something that you can tell your patients. And if, in those patients who are about to have syncope, these postures can be very helpful. This is another helpful posture, which doesn't look so awkward. If you're standing in line in a queue, in a train, in a bus stop, in a bank, you can, you can often cross your legs and continue to cross back and forth and press your front leg against your back leg. And that again will give you some venous return. Of course, squatting is more obvious. <clears throat> and when you squat down in a tube, people often are compelled to offer you a seat, including that guy in a business suit reading the Financial Times. So it's a very, very helpful exercise. You're shaking your head, Leslie, but you should come to London sometime and see the people in uh, the tube who don't give any uh, seats up because they're too busy. So if you squat down, you don't have to feign or you don't have to, you, you tell your patients, you just have to squat down, people will give you a seat. And this is a very helpful exercise to increase your blood pressure. What's the problem with this exercise? It's when you stand up, and this is the, the very, very uh, likely time you will have syncope when you stand up. So from getting here to your seat, and I always imagine it on the London Underground, because that's where most of this happens in my patient population, you need to travel very safely from this, from this squatting position to the seated position, clenching all the time. And then when you're seating, so when you sit like this, again, you see he's leaning forwards, his arms are held like this, and this is an isometric clenching exercise in his arms. So very subtle pictures, but actually you can learn so much from this four diagrams about the subtleties you can teach your patients to try and avoid impending syncope. How effective is it? There's one trial, which is the physical counter maneuvers trial, uh, published some time ago now, and it shows that it's better than conventional therapy for uh, a syncope-free survival. Uh, but, but in practice, I, I know that this is one of the most powerful things that works in day-to-day -day practice. It's not sexy, it's not an alternative treatment, but surely this is something at least you should communicate to every one of your patients. So we talk about the other things, and here I've picked and chosen some things, um, not really focused on, on the rest because of time constraints, but there is um, an increasing, uh, how shall I say, for, for me, uh, a personal journey. And I've seen a few patients who've made a big difference in the symptoms. Uh, typically the patients who are anxious about the syncope by doing not only yoga, but relaxation exercises, meditation, these kind of aspects of treatment are getting more and more important. And you often can tell these patients as they come into the room, highly wired, highly switched on. And sometimes uh, having somebody say to them that actually part of the, the, the treatment process, a holistic view, is that you need to uh, kind of switch off, learn to switch off. It helps with sleep. It helps with ability to adopt and adapt to the uh, treatment strategies. It helps them to pay attention to, them, to, to themselves, right? And to take the appropriate conservative strategies that they need. And here is a paper published in JICE 2015 by the Lucky Ready Group, um, uh, who, who demonstrated that uh, yoga therapy can potentially improve the symptoms of pre-syncope and syncope in female patients with neurocardiogenic syncope. So, the asanas, in particular, I was interested to read, refer to isotonic, by that I think it's isometric exercises, to help to learn the patients to train the muscle memory, what's needed to compress and to cause that vasoconstriction to push the blood back up. And so this could be part of that, 
But part of that could also be due to the breathing exercises that Nick talked about earlier on, which is so important in regulating your autonomic expression. We all know about, or maybe we don't, but there is this respiratory sinus arrhythmia. If all of you in the room take a deep breath over six seconds and feel your pulse, and take a deep breath out and feel your pulse, you will note your pulse will change by about five to 10 points. <laughs> Now, this can help to regulate your heart rate response. And in taking a deep breath in to relax, you're going to be able to influence your autonomics in a very meaningful way. And if you do it regularly, my brother is a yoga master and has been influenced by yoga over the last three years and has influenced me a lot as well. And I've noticed the transformation in him, in his calmness, in his ability uh, to I, I would go as far as to say cure all illnesses. He's suffered with sinusitis for the longest time. And over the last three years, this is spontaneously cured. Um, so it, it's something that has a deep-seated, um, unproven scientific, uh, un, it's not proven science, but there is a lot of science that isn't discovered till you do the trial. And there's this bit about um, intergenerational passing down of information and uh, millions of people around the world practice yoga and yet it will never be considered in a forum like this as something that's serious enough to make an impact but for your patient for my brother for me for that one person in whom it does make an impact it's very real so it's something that we shouldn't necessarily dis dismiss. And even if you're not comfortable to prescribe it, if a patient comes to you and says something, something wacky, like I've tried this and it works. I've tried the new age diet and it works. I've tried meditation, and it works. I've tried energy healing and it works. Who are you to take it away from them? We owe it to them to at least be open about whatever makes them better. Call it what you will. It could be placebo, who cares? your patient's better. So at least have an open mind about these things because the science may not come for many years yet. GP ablation is the next thing I want to talk about. And this is ablation of the ganglionated plexi. So why am I interested? I did my PhD studying the role of these GPs, which are this octopus-like structures, which with a central body and many many branches, so the ramifying elements of the axons, which go into the pulmonary veins, but which also innervate the sinoatrial node and the AV node. And this was part of my PhD on the role of looking at these guys in atrial fibrillation. And it's because of this that I gain an understanding about how to access this, both in cardiac surgery, so you could visualize the fat pads by opening up Waterstone's groove, seeing a beating heart, and we could put a temporary pacing wire on the fat pad. Of course, it didn't have a label like this. It doesn't look anything like this. It's fat, it's a beating heart, and you gotta guess where you're putting this damn probe. But when you stimulate it, you could get eight, 10 seconds of asystole. So you're having a very, very profound effect on the autonomics in the heart by direct stimulation of these ganglionated plexi. And here's the first paper that uh, studied 43 patients from Pashon. And this was now in 2011. And uh, having spoken to him and having seen his technique, he, he has used a very similar technique, but also looked at quantifying or performing spectral analysis on the endocardial signals to try and establish these sites of potential interest. This field, by the way, is extremely, not extremely, but it's much more advanced in the era of AF ablation. There are many trialists around the world, Imperial is one of them where I work, who are studying the direct effects of autonomic ablation and autonomic stimulation endocardially and its role in arrhythmogenesis and atrial fibrillation. So this is not new. We know how to do this. We know how to get into the heart and stimulate. And then Yan Yao from Beijing in China published a similar number of patients, 57, again on speaking to him and speaking to Richard, who was chairing the session in which Yan Yao first presented. 
the results seem very credible. And these were spectacular results. Uh, uh, 52 patients out of 57 patients remain free of syncope, very similar to the Pashan group. Pashan has since published a five-year follow-up and the results remain strikingly positive, uh, good for uh, patients to not have any further syncope. So these are some of the techniques. Um, and this is what we call spectral analysis, where we think in a very nicely coupled uh, myocardial cell architecture, we have heterogeneous depolarization and a very nice, stable, uh, single or double component signals that when we apply a fast Fourier transform, which is a form of spectral analysis to deconstruct the signal into its constituent parts, we get a nice, nice compact signal. And when you do a sinus rhythm map with a multipolar mapping catheter, and you then imagine, and this is schematic, it's way simpler than we imagine, but it makes the point quite nicely, you have decoupling of this. So with intermittent activations of the autonomic nervous system, you get differential expressions of acetylcholine, noadrenaline, in between the myocardial cells. And this changes the refractory periods and conduction. And so what you expect is multiple deflections from recorded from an electrogram in the same place. And when you put this through a fast Fourier transform, you get a fibrillar nest or fibrillar myocardium spectro. And this is what Pashon used to try and quantify where these GPs are located. And in his paper, he ablated all these areas in red where he identified this fibrillar myocardium, as I talked about, as opposed to the compact myocardium and got the results that he had. So the survival probability without syncope post cardioneuroablation is very high, right? N equals 43, it's about 91%. But the problem with this graph is where is the control group? What does the control group do? Patients who come to my clinic with severe syncope or to come to any of our clinics, I bet you if you told them to clench the buttocks, to do the posturing, to drink more salt and water, they would also get better. Do they get as good as 90%? Perhaps, depending on how much they take in. So none of these ablation trials actually have a control group. And this needs to change if we're going to take ablation forward. I'd like to present my own experience. So we've done a handful of ablations, maybe seven, and this is the most striking response that we've done. Just to explain, these are patients who we do not have any uh, HRG code or any uh, approval from any uh, CCG or GPs to do the ablation. And we're, we're hitting into grounds that may be uh, quite dangerous. So we need to fully justify an ablation for these patients. And the only way I could do it where I work is to go to the new Interventional Procedures Committee and make a plea in desperation for individualized patients and discuss it clearly at the electrophysiology MDT at Imperial where I work and get approval. So at least if something happens, I don't lose my job. We're not out on a limb. So we need to have these discussions firmed up. It can be done. It takes a bit of effort, but it can be done. But what really needs to be done is some f we need to get funding and we need to get the research going for a true randomized sham control study, which will really answer the question whether cardi um, neurocardiogenic syncope ablation works. But my patient was a 27-year-old woman studying postgraduate nursing degree at Southampton, a patient of Richard's before me. And since her severe flu in 2012, she was missing placements, lectures due to extreme symptoms of tiredness. But prior to seeing me in 2012, she had already seen Richard with similar, with similar but less severe episodes of syncope with a tilt test that he had performed confirming vasovagal syncope, responded very well initially to midodrine with complete abolition of symptoms at that point. She was fit and healthy as a child. And since her teenage years, she had suffered with mild irritable bowel syndrome. She has hypermobility and she was doing well with the fluid intake and, and doing all the conservative advice that we talked about. And she was on maximal, what I consider maximal medical therapy on midodrine 10 TDS, fluidocortisone 200 
and a very in 5 BD because she also suffered with palpitations. And this was a symptom diary when <clears throat> we were doing her or contemplating uh, further management on her. So faint on the 3rd of July, faint on the 6th of July, walking out of the toilet, near faint on the 7th of July, faint on the 8th of July. So highly symptomatic patient with um, clear evidence of vasovagal syncope proven on tilt. And this is an early syncopal response on tilt prior to GTN. So this was, uh, so in our tilt protocol, we have five minutes in the supine position. At this point, we do a hit up tilt we can see her heart rate rises from 60 to about 95. And in the first 10 minutes, it goes to probably 105. And here is the key thing. She declares only minor symptoms there, minor. But at that point, can you see how short this time is? Maybe six seconds. She starts to have a first symptom. So in our tilt lab, we have the vertical markers as patient event. At five minutes, this is the head up tilt. So that marker signifies patient event. Here, the patient suffers with palpitations, mild symptoms, mild symptoms. Here is when she feels she's going to go off. And I would say she has a very short prodrome on this tilt before her blood pressure collapses. Can you see? And her heart rate starts to fall. So... I see her after one year and she continues to have frequent episodes over 12 months with those treatments and has had significant injuries on a number of occasions, including a black eye once when I saw her in clinic. But she, what really brought things to a head was that she was still trying to keep a job as a PA at the time in central London. And she fell down the stairs at Euston. Um, the, not stairs, the, the escalators. And it was quite a tumble over very many steps. She went into UCH, was discharged the same day, and three days later came in with an excruciating headache, and she was found to have a subdual hematoma. And this, in my mind, apart from her drive and determination to continue working, was a very sensible girl. She, she had an immediate connection with, with Trish and me in clinic. She wasn't one of those who didn't pay attention. So she was drinking, she was salting, she was taking her medications on time, and yet did not have enough warning to sit down to prevent that tumble down the escalator. So at that point, we took her to the MDT, we took her to the new interventional procedures committee at Hammersmith, and we discussed the option of syncope ablation on her. Note that she did not have cardio inhibition, uh, which is one of the common themes of all the other trials, where we think that cardio inhibition is the thing we want to get rid of. So we remove the vagal influence to the sinoatrial node and the AV node, and we allow them to no longer have that reflex vagal activation. But this patient did not have cardio inhibition on this tilt. And we brought her for the ablation. And just to give you an example of what we might see, this is a blood pressure trace. This is an ECG. This is some noise from our pacing at high voltage. When we turn on the high frequency stimulation at the ganglionated plexi site near her AV node, we can develop, we can cause her to have eight seconds of asystole without any ECGs, without any blood pressure. And she, she comes close to, well, she's on the GA now, but if this was happening in life, she would have lost consciousness. And what we did is using 3D mapping, in this case, it's Carto, we were able to construct a geometry and tag points of negative HFS. So when we did the stimulation at every point, we would tag whether it would cause asystole or no asystole. So this is no asystole, no asystole, no asystole. And here in the right anterior septum on, in front of the right inferior pulmonary vein, which is on the left atrial side, we found spots of green. So this is a more uh, right lateral view. Right? So this is a picture of the left atrium, right upper pulmonary vein, right lower pulmonary vein, left upper, left lower. And these are the sites where she had her positive vagal responses. And these are the sites that we ablated. And you can ablate and you can test afterwards. So it's an immediate response. You get eight seconds of asystole, you ablate, you no longer have eight seconds of asystole. So you've abolished the, the, uh, the vagal reflex with a very nice intraprocedural endpoint. 
And these are some of the other clusters that one may find and ha has been described in the literature to cluster around in an anatomical approach, which means you do not go and do high frequency stim, you just cluster at the sites of presumed ganglionated plexi, where incidentally, Sonny Jackman drew them in to the HRS guidelines. So you know that big picture with the yellow octopuses or octopi? Uh, it was all drawn in by one person, Sonny Jackman from Oklahoma. So this is where we've, we, we've done the ablation, assuming of course, <laughs> that these GPs are very stable in location and site across all patients, which is not true. And yet we've been able to find that the, the people who have done this approach have been able to demonstrate that it also works. So there's something very strange about the methodology that I do not understand, because how can it be that we all have a uniform series of GPs always located at these four sites and nowhere else? There's something that we need to understand more. This is a tilt table test in 2008. This is a tilt table test before I ablated her. You can see very similar findings before GTN heart rate response up from 80 to now 105 and then 120. And within 13 minutes of standing up, her blood pressure falls, heart rate falls, she has syncope, maybe with slightly longer warning on this particular tilt pre-ablation. And this is October 2013, three months following the ablation. Now she it was remarkable. She woke up after the ablation and she, she said, I, I know, I know something's different. She said to me, and I went, bullshit. Oh, I mean, I didn't go to her. <laughs> I said to Trish, this is bullshit. Uh, because it can't be real, can it? <clears throat> because this is either the greatest placebo in the world or the most spectacular result that I've seen. Because these are two tilts, remember? 2008, 2013 and 2013, three months after dublation, the heart rate is now in the 50s. And on head up tilt, do you remember what you saw earlier on? What did we see? We saw a heart rate rise to a POTS-like level, correct? If you define POTS as greater than 30 bits per minute. And what have we done here? For 20 minutes, so she got to 20 minutes and said, what's going on? It's 20 minutes. I've never been standing for more than 15. And then when we gave GTN, yes, we could push up a heart rate by forcing the vasodilatation, but look where it goes to. It goes to 85, 90, and she withstands the whole of the uh, full active tilt assault without symptoms. And when I saw her 36 months on, she only had six further episodes of syncope always with prolonged warning, clear triggers, on two occasions, period pain, on three occasions, joint pains, and one on a, on a hen night trip to an aeroplane whilst dehydrated after a holiday. She's married, she has a baby who's fit and healthy, and she's gone on a bike ride with her husband to raise money for the BHF. And she remains upbeat, although right now her major issue are joints because she also now has seen the hypermobility unit and has had a diagnosis of EDS. But if this was EDS and if this was POTS, gosh, have we cured the first POTS patients by a syncope ablation approach? <coughs> I don't know and I don't understand. So the question is, there was a very profound immediate effect. She woke up and she said, I feel different. And it transpires that 36 months on, and in fact, we saw her in clinic, Trish, when? Six months ago, longer. And seriously, she's, she is transformed. She's got other issues now with her joints, but syncope is not one of them. And imagine, this is a very nice, again, simplistic schema of the autonomic system as it comes down from our brain, our pons, into the, uh, it, it typically follows the root of vessels and it comes down to innovate the heart. And yet we're distilling all this complex series of ramifying neurons into yellow blobs in the heart, which we can just target just like that. And yet it appears to give such a profound effect on patients. So uh, 
my feeling about autonomic ablation is that it has transformed some of my patients, and certainly in Yen Yao's group, in Pashan's group, it has really done wonders for their series of maybe a hundred odd patients. I still don't understand how it works, but syncope in a nutshell for the rest of us, if we talk about novel treatment, from a personal point of view, we come away from this alternative treatments which are beyond most of our reaches, would be to do with education. And if that's the one alternative therapy you take away, I would say education for yourself, but also the ability to educate your patients in a meaningful way. In the first bit of the talk, I talked about some of the strategies and demonstrations you could do to them or for, for them to, to, to teach them. This is the way to help uh, build the confidence, the trust, and to help patients, uh, to help you acknowledge the severity of their illness and to give them the reassurance that they need. So try and make your patients consult with you their, their most meaningful consult with any medical health care professional. You don't need to send them to a syncope specialist elsewhere. You, you can do it. Use the tools that you've learned, use the education that you have now, and teach every patient and make their lives better. Don't, don't, don't wait or don't send them elsewhere. You are empowered. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop there and take questions. Okay? So actually, our, our, our next, I don't know if the mic's on or not. It is. The next talk is uh, by Professor Sutton related to AFib ablation, or not AFib ablation, syncope ablation as well. Um, I think it might be best to let Professor Sutton talk and then maybe have questions for both of them um, as a compare and contrast, if you will. While we're waiting for the slides, I think you all are probably familiar with Professor Sutton. He currently runs the syncope unit in Monte Carlo. Absolutely not. <laughs> I did briefly aspire to that, but they didn't want me. So uh, you might ask, what am I doing here? Uh, I'm not known for my ablation skills. I actually have done a few AV nodes and one WBW with reasonable success, but it was a long time ago. My interest, of course, is the therapy for vasovagal syncope when it's really difficult. The interest was kindled by Jose Pachon, whom you've heard about. He, he gave a presentation on his first patients in 2004, CardioStim. And I was impressed. So I went up to him afterwards and I said, write this up and I'd like to see it in Europace, which I was then editor of. And he did. It was hard work as the editor because uh, his, his English isn't all that good. Written English particularly, I had to rewrite the whole thing. But it came out well. And uh, so uh, I think he invented the term cardioneuroablation. And a, a definition proposed is that it's the use of endocardioablation techniques to modify the behavior of the cardiac autonomic nervous system to prevent some, all of the autonomic processes occurring in phase of vagal syncope. And that's cardioneuroblation. There have since have followed, and you, you've already been aware of some of these things, a uh, later publication by Pachon of 43 patients, and Yan Yao, uh, whom I visited in Beijing, and uh, see him at least once a year at Heart Rhythm Society. Uh, he published 10 patients in uh, 2012, I think it was, and then later 57. So it's a total of 67, but when I met him last, he said, we've done 200 now. So uh, uh, we'll hear about that later. Now, there, there are other quite important contributors in relatively small numbers. There's Aksu in, in Turkey. I, I can't pronounce the name of the city, so I won't try. Uh, a colleague in a different hospital in Sao Paulo, uh, Maurizio Scanavaca, um, uh, of uh, Pachon, uh, Rebecca in Rome, and De Bruyne in Belgium. 
Uh, so the reported cases, reported cases already, amount to more than 170 uh, by last year. And the success rate has been high, with quite long follow-up in many cases. Here, here's some tabulation of what I could find in the literature. And I want to draw your attention particularly to the site of ablation which is the second listed. You have the, the author or head of department, the year in which published, and the number done, and a recurrence of syncope, and the duration of follow-up. So Pachon does both atria, and he uses the technique that uh, uh, Boone described much better than I would, but fast Fourier transform, to locate the fractionated uh, complexes and ablate there, but in both atria. Uh, Scanavac are also used both atria. Pachon again, the same, but Yan Yao, left atrium only. And then we have, for me, fairly bizarre, Rebecca and uh, De Bruin, right atrium only. And uh, uh, Scanavac are coming back for a second uh, small number, uh, right atrium only. Uh, Axu, both atria. So there's not much agreement about what to do, although everybody agrees it's the ganglionic plexi that, which are the targets. So different techniques, there is overlap in everybody addresses the left atrium. No, even that's not really true. Um, so we have two operators addressing only the right atrium. Um, then how do we assess what's happened? Well, we should expect some increase in sinus rate. And um, do we use atropine to see what we could get? Um, heart rate variability should show a, a shift to dominance of sympathetic and tilt testing. And you know, if you read carefully the SE guidelines, they, you will see that it is not recommended to retilt patients after therapy. So here we've thrown that away, and uh, tilt testing does seem to be informative and may have to be repeated a number of times depending on the progress of the patient. But we would expect things like you saw, um, faster heart rates, hopefully no syncope, or if you do have syncope, it phase of depression only. Uh, there needs to be some agreement on how to do this uh, for the hoped for trial. Uh, so far, there've been no controls, uh, but the results to me suggest that there's something in this. And uh, a follow-up has been long enough, at least in some of the series, uh, to suggest that reinnovation is delayed or perhaps doesn't occur. There needs to be agreement on the techniques and agreement on how to assess the results. Um, how to find the ganglionic plexi. Uh, Pachon has one technique which nobody else has taken up. Uh, Yan Yao does it by high frequency stimulation, which you heard about. And once the vagal response is uh, fatigued, shall we say, uh, then he stops. Um, Aksu uses a slightly different technique. He's also seeking fractionated complexes, uh, but only by waveform analysis, which doesn't include fast Fourier transforms. Um, his results are not really very clear because the follow-up wasn't very long, but it, it seems that his faster technique actually might not be uh, any better. Now, those of you who are looking at these things will know exactly what this shows um, if they do ablations. And the rest of us, including me, just nod. Um, and so we, we, we saw this, this is Axu's technique. And I took these because the pictures look nice, I thought. And this is uh, Yao's technique. And uh, so assessment of effect, we said something about this already. 
So ablation itself uh, prompts the, the vagal response to diminish and stop. Um, and we need to have very good instant assessments of what's happening, uh, what the effect is during the procedure and afterwards. Um, of course, we're, we're most interested in if syncope is abolished, uh, but uh, we must be interested in prodromes, which don't result in syncope, uh, pre-syncope, and we will undoubtedly need a halter for heart rhythm, for uh, uh, heart rate variation, and uh, uh, tilt elimination, at least of the cardioinhibitory component. But Boone and his patient gave us another dimension, I think, that this possibly could even work for vasodepression. Um, so, but precise criteria are not established. But if we could make steps along this way, there's a basis for a randomized control trial. But who are the controls? What do they undergo uh, as a sham procedure? This is perhaps the most difficult part. But only in such a way, if we have a control trial that shows benefit, can we start to believe in this as a therapy and apply it more broadly? And then should we compare this with pacing? Uh, ablation is the more potentially dangerous technique acutely. But pacing would appear, especially in the younger patient, to carry uh, long-term morbidity that exceeds that of ablation. Pacing has randomized controlled trials that demonstrate efficacy over 12, 24 months. So we have issue three and Spain, basically. Um, ablation has no such credentials, as we, we have both emphasized. Given the potential for adverse effects of both therapies, that is, cardioinhibitor and pacing, um, that they will be restricted to highly symptomatic patients. That, that I think we'd all agree on that. Uh, ablation can only challenge pacing for these patients as a tenable therapy if it has uh, a randomized control trial uh, to back it up. This is the issue three intention to treat. You remember this, I'm sure. And uh, we had a significant difference between pacemaker on and pacemaker off, uh, but pacemaker on wasn't all that good. There's room for improvement. So to conclude, this, I believe, is an area uh, uh, for treatment of severe phase of vehicle syncope that justifies more attention. But notably, we want a trial. A any thoughts, any help would be very welcome. Thank you for your attention. So we have time for a few questions. Um, I think all three speakers are fair game. If you... We'll get you a microphone. Oh. Uh, just a quick question to, to both of you, really. Um, you know, the previous uh, understanding about um, vasovagal syncope, neurocardiogenic syncope, has been the prime mover in this, is the drop in blood pressure, the, the vasodepressor aspect, and addressing that with the sort of various modalities you've already talked about. You know, the aim is to actually stop that initial trigger and the secondary sort of component has always been whether they have cardio inhibition or not. But it, so what you're describing now in terms of the cardioneural ablation is you're now talking about two separate pathologies which may or may not be necessarily related to one another or they may have, a, they may have an equal effect, which up until now hasn't necessarily been something that I've sort of focused on. So I, I, I'll try it first. Um, I don't fully understand your question because phase of depression, in my view, happens in every phase of vagal patient. Cardio inhibition doesn't happen in, in every phase of vagal patient. And depending on the age, it, it varies. Uh, the, the attention by those who've done this was first towards cardio, cardio inhibition. It just might also work for vasodepression, uh, as indeed might pacing in the form of a CLS device. But this is all rather theoretical. 
Boonin, let's say something else. So I was just going to say that your um, <laughs> that that the that the premise that we understand the mechanisms at play here is is co completely wrong. So we we don't. We don't get it. We don't understand. We all know that there are many, many reflexes, including a ventricular, ventricular reflex, uh, baroreceptor reflex, but a respiratory ventricular reflex. So the respiratory connected to the heart. So we 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 may be modifying things that we don't understand. We also don't understand whether we're modifying the efferent, which is the uh, effector cell going from the brain to the heart, or are we modifying the afferent, which I, which I think we are too. I mean, I know we are. Because if we're modifying the inputs to the autonomic nervous system, you know that, that diagram I showed about how it all starts from here to here to here to here? Mm -hmm. What if what we're doing in ablation is actually affecting what's going, the traffic going up to the heart, not down the heart? So the cardiac inhibition was a red herring. It's quite nice to think we're fixing severe patients that you would otherwise not want to pace, right? And Richard's view is compared against pacing. But I would take a more uh, 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 backward or upstream view, upstream view, to understand exactly what's going on. So if we are really affecting the afferent supply, then the whole cascade can be dampened down. And that may work, like in my patient, for the blood pressure, for the, the kind of apparent lack of tachycardia. All that is dampened. So, is this on? No, it's not on. We have this microphone on, please. Thank you. So I think, Boone, I think you may be right. You know, I think it's time to rethink this. The, these are all part of the little brain of the heart that came out of uh, Drew Armour's work about 20, 25 years ago. And they, the scattered observations that suggest that there might be something going on here, so CLS pacing may or may not work. That needs to be, you know, we need to understand if it works or not. But if it does work, it may work like this. Atropine, the old Santini placebo-controlled IV atropine study was positive, which looks like this. I think the final thing is that actually this may be the first invasive cure of the POTS part of the much larger POTS syndrome, right? She went on having all her other stuff, Ehlers-Danlos, I think she had some for GI stuff as well. She did. Yeah, so, you know, she's got POTS plus. But this may have fixed the palpitations, which is really interesting. It is. I, I mean, j just to add to the story, we tilted her, Trish, uh, two years ago. So this is a 2017 tilt, so five year history from her ablation. Um, she got to 40 minutes as well. And it, it still was the same profile as it was following the tilt. So we've tilted her twice before and now twice after, five years apart. And she has a lot of time on her hands. <laughs> no, she doesn't. She keeps on I, coming back for these useless no, tilts. No, no, so I try to keep her away. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, Richard, go on. We'll, we'll send you home. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Let's de-invite him. Could, could I ask two questions, please? Um, I probably ought to know more about tilt training, um, and I don't know much about it. Is it something that you give instructions to the patients to teach themselves at home, or is it more supervised like cardiac rehab? Um, and the, the second question was about the, the tests, the alternative therapies. Um, question. Um, do you apply most of them to most patients or would something about obviously reserving the, the ablation for refractory cases or do you, is there something about the history or something about the pre-testing, the tilt testing for example that might determine that um, compression stockings are likely to work well or that yoga might work well or something like that? Well, it's a, it's a good question. So to uh, so just tell me your first question again. The first question was easier. I just can't question. remember it now. <laughs> yeah, I also can't yeah. remember because I got tilt swept away with your training. The, the, t the tilt training, how, how you, ah, whether, so you whether you give instructions. So for, for, for me, those patients who you see who have syncope twice a year on their commute to work during stressful times and if they're on their monthly menstrual cycle, I don't do tilt training. Tilt training is reserved for those who are significantly affected every time they stand up. And the only way you can get them to do anything before they even start to exercise is to start to tilt train, which is the exactly 
Oh, I didn't show the picture. Sorry, I took it out. Um, but you stand <coughs> with your legs in front of the wall, pillows on the side, and then you just lean back like this. So shoulder width apart legs, and you just stand there. And you try and stand for 20 or 30 minutes. And I've had two patients who've had a remarkable improvement to the extent that they then can come and do exercise. So once they can tilt train and they get their autostatic tolerance improved, they can start to exercise and then they're on that route. So to an honest answer is I don't use it that often because most of my patients are the once or twice a year fainters. So they don't comply. I mean, the key thing you said was that these patients you do treat that way uh, have very frequent symptoms, but not necessarily syncope, but dizziness on standing, that sort of thing. Yeah, so the, the, those patients who will generally comply have a bad life, right? So they, they can't get out of bed. So they're grabbing at something that you can give them to do. And you say, go and exercise. They can't even get out of bed, let alone exercise. So you give them something gentler. So that's when I use tilt, tilt training. I think the people, there, there are others in the room who, who, who may not uh, prescribe it. I, I'm, I'm nicely dodging the second question, uh, but uh, it's using using so, investigations and history yeah. to choose the therapy. Yeah, so I, I do a bit of that. I can't tell you how I do it. It's an it's a it's a nuance um, trying to look at my own mood, my own interaction with the patient, and trying to understand what I feel is best for the patient. It comes with a bit of experience. Sometimes the tilt can be very effective. If you see a patient complaining dominantly of palpitations with no orthostatic drop, with not POTS, but kind of the vasovagal syncope with a lot of palpitations, Ivarbidine can work wonders. So I, I, I actually use the tilt data to direct therapy, because I certainly would not give minadrin in somebody whose resting blood pressure is already 130. Tilt up, it might drop to 120, it might go to 135. It might oscillate, so you don't know really what the blood pressure is, because when you take it on the stand test, it tends to overestimate that value. But the tilt, giving that oscillation is very helpful. So I might not use minadrin there, because the, the blood pressure is already quite good, but I know they're highly symptomatic, because th there's this yo-yoing pattern. So I might push fluid, salt, fluid or cortisone in that situation. Compression for everyone. Compression for everyone. Hi, Boone. Richard, thank you for your talks. Uh, in terms of the uh, overexpression of different uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic drives in POTS versus VVS, could it simply be that actually within the GPs there's an overexpression of one for one condition versus the other, and therefore plating the GPs might have may improve a POTS patient's POTS symptoms versus a VVS patient's vas vasovagal symptoms? So, Saj, I, I think the answer is we don't know, but when you say overexpression of the GPs, I think you need to go upstream. Yeah. It's not at the level of the GPs I think we need to worry about. It's much higher. So where they come from and what that... I think about it as a gain, right? A servo mechanism that you have this oscillatory components. So if you have a flood of efferent signals from whatever the trigger was, i.e. ventricular lack of filling or reduced venous return, and your bare receptor gain is cranked up times 10, as opposed to most of us times one or times two, then your heart rate response to standing is going to be like this, right? Because a POTS patient don't only accelerate heart rate, they accelerate the magnitude of oscillations. If you've mm. seen enough tilts, mm. and you have, Saj, you have seen that they yo-yo, and they can yo-yo by about 40 mm. millimeters of mercury yeah. and 40 beats per minute. Now imagine on a 10 second cycle, you are getting a blood pressure of 80 and then 120, and then 80, and then 120, with the heart rate doing a similar thing from, let's say, 90 to 130, how does that uh, fit in? And what is the mechanism that causes that? So it's not, I think, at the level of the GP that's causing it. It's a much higher mechanism that is cranked up too high. And when you touch the autonomic ganglia uh, and, you, and, you, and you attack it and you disrupt a little bit, it doesn't take a lot to disrupt it which is why it can come back into place, because we are all built to try and come back to normality. You just have to, to, to tweak it, which, is, which I think, my personal theory, is why all these different techniques work, left atrial, right atrial, uh, bi atrial, uh, why, why they could work is because they are just disrupting that, that extra gain in, in that yo-yoing thing that allows you to heal that allows the heart to come back to what its natural state should be. They're all linked, of course. 
Of course. So just a question about the yo-yoing. Are you referring to exaggerated Meyer waves or are you talking about something else? I think the 10 second oscillations are uh, Meyer waves at rest. Yeah. The, the 10 second oscillations during provoked tilting could be enhanced Meyer waves, but they could be something else. I, I don't know the answer to that question. What's yes, your my, my question is, do you not think that this is hypovolemic, like low cardiac return? I mean, you see this, at least I used to when I visited the ICU more, but you see this in hypovolemic patients in the unit even while supine. Our assumption's been, you know, when they're tilted, they're, there's less cardiac, there's relative cardiac hypovolemia compared to standing, or compared to supine. Do you not think that's the waves? So yes, uh, that can exaggerate your waves, but there's something addition with this POTS patients that causes a secondary exaggeration. It could be, it could be what's what they're thinking. It could be the anxiety component coming in to enhance that sympathetic effect. Uh, but it's a good point. So we should give intravenous saline to some of our patients and see what happens to the May waves. They all diminish, of course. So. Just, can I just um, just make sure I got it right? So when you ablate these GPs, are you also ablating um, sympathetic um, yes. afferent and efferents That's as right. well as parasympathetic? Afferent. And, and the third thing you're ablating is interneurons. So most of your GPs are consist of interneurons. So there is a sympathetic and parasympathetic, efferents and afferents. So there are four things already. And then you complicate it by saying connecting neurons. So neurons that talk to each other. So how does the right upper GP communicate with the left upper GP? There are interconnecting neurons. And those interneurons are, I think, make up um, 85%, it is said, by the likes of people who know more, like Drew Arma. Uh, Last next. question, Bob. Uh, so I'm up here, so actually, so I can see you. Um, so we do some clinical trials, and the things that are critical when you're setting them up are inclusion criteria and the magnitude of the improvement. And so I need everybody to tell me what they think, family doctors, internists, cardiologists, EP, everybody. So the first question is, how bad do they need to be before you as treating physicians, not investigating physicians, before you would consider this? Right? Because when I look at the papers, actually, the, these patients don't look all that bad. Some of them, they're sort of on the lower end of the ones that are in the post studies, which is far more benign treatment. So uh, would they have to faint at least once in the previous year? Put up your hands. Yeah, at least once. Yeah, at least once. At least three times in the previous year? Yeah. At least ten times in the previous year? No. I mean, not... not okay, so somewhere between three and ten times in the previous year. Okay. Actually, just, and how many, it doesn't really matter. There's no way that you're going to let Boone get your, his hands on these patients. So everyone, everyone's open to this. Okay. Okay, so they have to be at least... Moderately so you're worse. Yeah. So, so by way of giving us some benchmarks in the in the VPS studies, the original pacemaker studies, and in the post studies, the median number in the previous year sort of sits around three or four. So they have to be at least the median of what gets in the post studies. If you do that, actually, you'll have a high likelihood. You'll have a, a, a likelihood of an outcome in the next year of about sixty percent. So the next question is, what magnitude, as, treating, as, as human treating physicians, what magnitude of improvement would you like to see uh, in these patients, right? Would you like to see them go from a likelihood of 60% of a faint, 60% fainting in the next year, down to 50% or 30%? Or ten percent, so down to fifty percent. Just before so, before you small change. to clarify, Bob, I'd like to see them never faint again. Are you asking what I'd like to see, or what my minimum what, difference would be that I'd accept? What, yeah, what what's the minimum improvement you're willing to tolerate in your patients to submit them to this? And I'm, this is not to slag it. This is if we're going to do a clinical trial, we need to know mm -hmm. what is reasonable because there's no way to, to figure out the power calculation from the data because there are no control subjects. So are you looking for a huge improvement? Are you looking for a 100% cure or a huge improvement or a modest improvement? So all in favor of cure, put up your hands, which is to say I will not submit a patient unless they get cured. So let me ask that again. 
cure some. Okay. Are you looking for a huge improvement before I will sit before I will some? Okay. What about a modest improvement? No. No. So a huge improvement would be something like 50 to 75 percent risk reduction, right? I, I By all if, means. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I wonder if you should look for a quality of life score instead. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because actually, if you go, the trouble about fainting, as everyone here will know, it, it's, it's about how much warning you get, it's how much it affects your quality of life as well. And if, if this procedure means they get a longer warning, but they still faint as often, that might completely transform life. So I, I, yeah. I would go much more for quality of life, Mark, personally. The Spain study is now has a quality of okay. life. Okay. Which is not yet published, but I've... It's really just a quick question about if you're looking at uh, entry criteria, is, do you actually need to have some objective evidence of on maximal yeah. therapy? Because we certainly see a number of you know psychogenic patients who continue to have frequent episodes of syncope. And it's actually looking for on maximal therapy to see, see the actual blood pressure changes and or heart rate changes before considering something like this. Okay, so you raised two really important points. The first is the, the psychogenic syncope, the, the, the non-biological lapses. If you're not really careful, these will be the patients that dominate the studies yeah, yeah. because these are the ones that are going down all the time and you're desperate about it, you don't know what's going on. And so we need to actually have an accurate way of keeping these poor suffering souls out of harm's way, because that's what this is, is harm's way. Um, and then maximal medical therapy. So if you stick around this afternoon, actually the topic of my talk is a post-mortem for drugs. So He's wrong, but that's okay. I gave you a soft one. Okay, so maximal, med you know, there's not a lot of medical therapy to be maximal. And... One thing we'd have to discuss before doing this as treating physicians and not investigating physicians is, you know, just what really would you expect to be done for your patients before you'd consider using this as routine care? So I think the point about the psychogenic is that you want them to faint a lot, but not too much, right? Yep. If they're fainting multiple times a day, no. stay away, even if you need no. three more patients to get to your recruitment target. Yeah. When everyone looks really good. Can't do that. Yeah. Well, uh, what, do, what do you want? Well, there are criteria. There are. It, it's not that difficult to come up with criteria to screen most of them out. Now, I think p people in the field have a pretty good idea of of how to of what the inclusion criteria are for psychogenic syncope. So uh, uh, tilt can be incredibly helpful in psychogenic pseudosyncope. So. And the incredible complex thing about them is they often have coexisting Both. vasovagal syncope yeah. and coexisting vasovagal pre-syncope. And that's a killer because the pre-syncopal anxiety and rise in adrenaline that gives them the tachycardia and everything else then leads to the psychogenic collapse without a further reduction in blood pressure. And you're often uh, confused, as everyone is, uh, including me. And in fact, one of the things that I didn't talk about was she was one of six patients I've ablated. I've ablated two patients with psychogenic pseudosyncope and regretted it because they haven't had any difference at all. But I was going for the pre-syncopal thing and I, I ablated them knowing full well that they had psychogenic pseudosyncope, but with that trigger being the pre-syncope. Sort of like mama bear, right? You want the porridge not to act on too cold? Sorry, we're, okay. we're trying to speak together, but I mean, psychogenic pseudosyncope is much more complicated than that because it's conversion in the brain. So it's too simplistic, yeah. I think, that's uh, that idea. 